Exodus literally means going out. If you're on a motorway in Greece today, where you'd see exit on a motorway in Britain, you see Exodus. It means the way out, and it's the way out of Egypt. Exodus is in itself a great story, um, but has become a foundational story for, for Israel, for Jews, uh, and in turn for Christians because of the importance of the story for the life of Israel. Um, so the story of the rescue from Egypt, God's rescuing uh, the people of Israel from Egypt becomes foundational in the formation of that people and their identity. It's important to begin with to notice that Exodus doesn't really stand alone, it doesn't stand by itself. It's actually a continuation in many ways of the book of Genesis and likewise Exodus is then uh, continued by the following books. Um, Leviticus, Numbers and, and, and Deuteronomy. The traditional Jewish and Christian view is that they were written as the first-hand work of Moses himself, the kind of eyewitness observer of the events, uh, for well over 150 years now. Most mainstream Old Testament scholars have believed that uh, they're actually not the work of one person at all, but they're what we might call a composite work. Well, you might well have come across some of the episodes in the life of Moses, and I suppose one, one familiar one would be the story of how uh, Moses as a baby was hidden by his parents. So in Exodus 2 starts, Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plasters it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. So Pharaoh's daughter eventually finds this basket he's brought up within um, that Egyptian context and saved in that way. But what's really interesting here is that in um, chapter 2, verse 3, the noun in Hebrew, uh, well, basket here, um, this same word only occurs twice in the Hebrew Old Testament. And the other place it occurs is in Genesis 6 in reference to Noah's Ark. The same word refers to the Ark, Noah's Ark, and also this basket that Moses is put in, in the reeds. And what the attentive reader will see in the context of, of the Pentateuch as a whole, the first five books of the Bible, as they're reading this narrative, is this is an indicator. The fact that this same word is being used for Noah's Ark, uh, which was when God rescued Noah and his family from certain death, is that here in Exodus, there's an indicator that Moses will be an agent for the rescue of God's people. Okay, So even right at the start of the story, there's this clue, which we don't see in English, because Noah's Ark is called an ark, uh, and in Exodus 2, 3 here, we have a reference to a, a basket in our English translations. Also the story of how Moses is said to have been uh, called by God to be the liberator of the enslaved Israelites, a story of, uh, of the burning bush. When Moses leaves Egypt, he asks God, who are you and who am I to, what name am I to tell people you are? And the authorised version, the King James Version says, say I am that I am. And that's often used by philosophers to mean that God is eternal and present and so on. The problem is that the Greek says I am, but the Hebrew doesn't. And the Hebrew tends to say, well this is a bit difficult to explain, it is, a, it is understood as a future, I will be what I will be. It's what in Hebrew is called the imperfect tense. And what it means is you'll find out, really, that who God is is a matter of experience and encounter, and you will find it. And it stresses God's dynamic nature. It, the last thing in the world that it's saying is a, a sort of suet pudding, I am what I am, as if there's nothing more to say. It's an open statement. The story of the crossing of the Red Sea also, of course, which is the great dramatic event when the, uh, the Israelites are actually leaving uh, Egypt, um, familiar from, especially from many epic films of the 20th century. I'm thinking, I guess, particularly about Cecil B. DeMille's 1956 epic with, uh, with Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston making this very rugged, uh, all-American hero type uh, Moses. Uh, and of course, a very vivid picture there in the film of how the waters of the Red Sea divide into two, the two great walls of water on, the, on, 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 on both sides, and the, the Israelites pass through, but the Egyptians are destroyed. I mean, it's important to say also about the book, book of Exodus that, that the second half of it uh, focuses on 
Another very important event, after the Israelites have left their slavery in Egypt, they arrive on their travels through the wilderness, through the desert at Mount Sinai. And there they enter into what's called a covenant relationship, a kind of special uh, relationship with, with God. But what fascinates me most in the book of Exodus and what I, what I think is important to, to realize is that it tells a story of liberation, but not a liberation in a kind of unconditioned freedom, but God releases his people or liberates his people from slavery in Egypt, led them into the wilderness to Mount Sinai, gave them a new law, gave them his commandments, and in a way obliged them to live according to his rule. So why is uh, Mount Sinai so important? Because Sinai is the mountain Moses climbed to meet God. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud on the mountain and a blast of a trumpet, so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln, while the whole mountain shook violently. So what is nowadays uh, shown as Mount Sinai with the monastery of St. Catherine, this is a, a location of the Mount Sinai which was made at a relative late stage. Okay, so yeah, you will see a mountain which is called Sinai um, and you can go and uh, go up it as if you're climbing the biblical mountain. But there is some uh, question as to whether this is the biblical Mount Sinai. Uh, so the two are not necessarily the same thing. The other possibility is that you find it here. It's written uh, Mount Horeb or Sinai. So this is an alternative location. And we find this actually in the book of, in Paul's letter to the Galatians, where he speaks about the Sinai, which is in Arabia. The Ark of the Covenant is, is mentioned in the account of the, the making of the covenant at Sinai, along with lots of other uh, instructions for how Israel's worship is to be organized. Uh, in Exodus 25, there's a very elaborate picture of the, the construction of the ark, the details of how it's made of wood and covered with gold and, and has these uh, kind of symbolic creatures, the cherubim on its, uh, on its lid and so on. It was an important thing in those days because God's presence was symbolized by a fire uh, at night or a cloud during the day and the Ark of the Covenant was a moving symbol of God's presence with Israel. Um, when it became discarded is a very interesting situation. That's not in Exodus, it was constantly in Exodus. But by the time we get to Samuel, uh, when Israel was fighting against the Philistines, they thought, well, if we could carry the ark with them, we'd be sure of success. But as it were, God through the, through the Bible said, you can't treat me as an instrument just for your welfare. I'm not here for your sake. And so he abandoned the Ark of the Covenant. It was no longer a guarantee of success and God's presence. In the context of Raiders of the Lost Ark, obviously what they're doing is looking for the Lost Ark. Uh, and so you may wonder if you're just watching the film, or well, well, what is this? But this is the biblical Ark, the Ark that's referred to here um, in Exodus. The issue is that there are actually several descriptions of the Ark in the, in the Bible. The one in Exodus 25, which I mentioned, uh, is a very elaborate later description of what uh, people believe the ark would have uh, would have looked like. Uh, it, it's connected with some very elaborate and important rites that went on in the worship of the uh, the ancient Israelite people. Uh, later on, the ark is said to have been uh, housed in the temple when that was built in in Jerusalem in the time of uh, King Solomon. Um, but in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter ten. On the other hand, there is uh, a picture of the ark which makes it a much simpler kind of uh, construction, uh, a simple wooden box which contains the, uh, the, the two stone tablets on which the, uh, the Ten Commandments were, uh, were written.